now to Mark chapter four, or excuse me, 15. We're going to be looking at the first uh, 15 verses today. Mark chapter 15. And as we have just seen last week, uh, well, in the past couple of weeks, we had Jesus um, in the garden. First, of course, uh, the Last Supper. Before that, where he told his disciples what was, again, what was going to take place. Then, being in the garden um, with the disciples, praying to the Father, if you will, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And then, ultimately saying, um, if it can't pass for me unless I drink it, your will be done. So be it. Then the arrest. Then the trial, really facing the Sanhedrin the first time. And now we're picking up, and of course we had Peter's denial, and now we're picking up in, in chapter 15, with the continuing trials, there were actually six trials during this time. There the first trial before the Sanhedrin, the time with he was sent to Annas, then back to the then back to the Sanhedrin again, then to Pilate. Pilate then sends him to Herod, and then he comes back to Pilate again. All of those details aren't giving us given to us in Mark. It's more of a condensed version. But you see the overall sweep of it, and some of those things we'll refer to. But the amazing thing to me, as I read this, as I studied uh, this passage this week, is how much the events of the um, trial and the crucifixion have parallels in the, this our modern uh, cultural and political environment because you see the way people are responding. You see the way uh, people are doing things, seeking to manipulate. And, it, and you see, well, things really haven't changed. What I'm referring to is the way the world functions as it tries to get its purposes accomplished. Um, It causes me to have a greater understanding for the political environment of the first century. But really what it comes down to here, and as we're facing it today, and as Pilate is facing in this situation, is exactly the question's always the same. What are you going to do with Jesus? In the midst of all of this, we were speaking in the discipleship class earlier about Romans chapter 1 and how people suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And you think about our country, you think about the situation that we're in now, you see so much taking place of suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. Why do you think they want to take memorials down and things like that? erase history, suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And we find these sorts of things, you know, throughout history. But here we see, especially with Pontius Pilate, how he reacts when he's confronted, first of all, with Jesus, who Jesus is, trying to come to grips, face the facts of who Jesus is. Um, that in the first five verses, but in verses one and two we read, immediately. That's, of course, Mark's favorite word. These things were happening fast. In the morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. That word for council is Sanhedrin. So it's the 70 elders, the Jewish elders, Jewish um, chief priests and scribes. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him to Pilate. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? 
He answered and said to him, It is as you say. Now this is the second time Jesus was before the Sanhedrin that we're looking at. It was a smaller group the night before that he was immediately taken to. And, and really, they had made the decision the night before. It's like, we want to get rid of Jesus. This is our, our opportunity. How are we going to do it? What can we charge him with? We can't just say, oh, he's committed blasphemy. We take him to the Romans and say blasphemy. They're going to laugh in our faces. So, what do we do? So they have to come up with charges. And, oh, he says he's a king. He says he's king of the Jews. People were referring to him as the king of the Jews. So we'll, we'll take him there with that charge, and we'll charge him then with sedition, rebellion. That's why later in John's account, when Pilate's trying to release Jesus, the people respond to him, or the people respond to him, oh, if you let him go, you're no friend of Caesar's because he claims to be king. So they formulate that, and as I said, he was sent to Annas as well. He comes back here, and now this morning trial, early morning trial before the Sanhedrin is really just a rubber stamp. It's just, okay, we've decided already in committee. Now let's just get together here and, and make it look official. Because it was illegal against the law, as we stated before, it was against the law for them to try someone at night. But they did it anyway. And to pass a sentence of, of death during the night or without waiting at least a day and having an opportunity to pray about it. Now, so they were formulating these charges to bring to Pontius Pilate. Now, Pontius Pilate was an interesting person. He was the Roman governor of Judea from 26 AD to 36. But he had come up through the ranks. He was a military man, uh, really a cavalry soldier. He is what he was, and he coming up through the ranks. Um, when he first came to Jerusalem, he offended the Jews by he brought, you know, all the Roman symbols, you know, the standards they would bring in, with had, had engraved images of Caesar. And, of course, he brought those in the city. And, of course, the Jewish people complained about that. Later, and, and the problem with Pilate somewhat is being a military man and not really caring that much about the political aspect of it, not really being completely politically adept. He did these, these things. Later, he took money from the temple to build a 35-mile aqueduct to Jerusalem. So... Of course, the Jewish people complained to Rome. When a protest formed, he sent disguised soldiers into the crowd who, on Pilate's signal, started beating people to death in the crowd. Now, that'll discourage them from complaining. The final straw that broke the camel's back was in 36 A.D., um, there was this Samaritan false prophet who was leading a group of his followers up to Mount Gerizim. Pilate didn't like that. He, took, he sent a group of soldiers up there and totally wiped them out. There was a complaint made to the king of Syria who relayed it to Rome they called Pilate back to Rome, exiled him to Gaul, where he and his wife both committed suicide. So this is the kind of person, this is the person that we're dealing with here in the making of this decision, of this supervising, if you will, this trial. 
So the Sanhedrin sent Jesus to this man, bound. Here we begin to see a number of actions that make no sense when you consider who we're dealing with here. And that's the Lord. And, and realizing who Jesus is and coming, to face, coming face to face with that truth. Pilate begins to interrogate Jesus to see if the charges that they've made are true. Jesus responds with a qualified yes to being king of the Jews. As he asks him, are you the king of the Jews? He says, you say. That's basically what he said. You say. Now, we get a clear picture of this from John 18, verses 36 and 37. Is Jesus, it says, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world... My servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I came, I have come into the world, that I should bear witness of the truth. Everyone who is of the truth Here's my voice. So, if he were to simply say, yes, I'm the king of the Jews, then that would have been the end of the story. That would have been conviction right there. But no, he said, my kingdom's not of this world. Or my followers, my servants would be fighting at the time. But it makes an important point here for us. What does it mean for Jesus to be king, to be our king? If we say that Jesus is our king, then our focus should be the same as his. Because the purpose is following our king. So that's something to look at for when we make decisions, when we think about our lives and what we're doing. Ultimately, is what I'm doing, am I serving my king? Or am I serving myself in the name of my king? In verse 3 we read, And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. The Jews began, the Jewish leaders just began to roll off accusations. They were just spilling it all out, you know, pouring it all, whatever they could say, throwing out, you know, everything in the kitchen sink to see if anything would stick. But Jesus didn't respond to any of the accusations. As far as he was concerned, as far as Jesus was concerned, the whole matter was settled in the garden ahead of time between him and the Father. Deal done. My kingdom's not of this world. I'm here in obedience to the Father. His will's being accomplished here. That's why he said nothing. You know, people often, are, often question, why, you know, why did he just say something? As far, though, well, from the eternal perspective as well, it wasn't Jesus who was on trial here. But his accusers. You see, Jesus, being God in the flesh, he's, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's the standard. Interesting how people so often, in wanting things their way, want to attack the standard. Last week, you might have heard that the CNN reporter Don Lemon declared that Jesus was not perfect. It wasn't Jesus who was judged last week.
when Pharaoh hardened his heart to God, it was he who was judged. When a person makes that final, ultimate rejection of Christ and who he is, it's he who is judged and not Christ. You know, as I said, the issue was first settled in the garden with the Father. And that's where we need to settle our issues as well. There's a time for legal action, and there's a time when it would be unfruitful and a bad witness. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 11 uh, warns them, or Paul really rebukes the Corinthians for taking um, one another to court before non-believers. Now, we've had this situation. Um, of course, my daughter was in college this year, and with the COVID situation, she had to come back early, and the college said they would credit everybody the room and board. For, the, for that time, it was supposed to be a credit of $900. Then we're informed that, well, the students coming back will have it credited to them. Those who graduate will get a check. But if you're not returning, you won't get a check. You won't get anything. So the choice there, what is the, in the middle of that is you look at it, ultimately, you know, you have to take situations like that and you have to go to the Lord and say, Lord, if you challenge something, sometimes you challenge things legally, it'll end up costing you more than, than you would get in return. But the ultimate thing is like the First Corinthians passage there, you know, what's the witness going to be in the all? There's a bigger picture here than whether or not you get a certain amount of cash back. And so, you know, so many things like this you have to leave in the Lord's hand and let the Lord be your defense. Let the Lord work the situations out. Um, and knowing that he's working according to his purpose. In verses 4 and 5 we read, Then Pilate asked him, Again saying, do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you? But Jesus still answering nothing so, Pilate, so that Pilate marveled. Pilate continued to interrogate Jesus because that's the word used for ask Jesus here a couple of times. Um, both you know, it, it means to interrogate, not simply to ask a question. Because what Jesus was doing simply, again, didn't make sense to him. Didn't make sense. He wasn't responding the way people would normally respond. Normally, respond, every, anyone would respond whatever way they could to save their lives in hopes of saving their lives, but Jesus wasn't doing that. Pilate was used to manipulating situations and worming his way through difficult situations. In fact, he was pointed governor by the influence of a friend with the emperor. And Pilate only yielded to something when he was forced to. But again, Jesus had already yielded to the will of the Father in the garden. When is it then appropriate to yield and when is it not? We read in Galatians chapter 2, Galatians 2 verse 5. Paul, in speaking about, of the, um, the Galatians, had a problem with a group of people referred to the Judaizers. They were people who came along, 
uh, usually after Paul had left his city. And they were the ones who taught that, that Gentile converts to, to the Lord had to be circumcised and follow the law of Moses. And so in this matter, in verse 5, Paul says, in referring to these people, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So his refusal to yield was a refusal to yield to keep the integrity of the gospel that was being preached. It was about the gospel. It was about the truth. That was the issue. Now in um, James chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, we read, For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So it's a willingness to yield in non-essential matters. Never yield when it comes to the truth of the gospel. That's why when someone is teaching false teaching, whether it be on the radio, TV, through mail, internet, whatever, stand against it because we're talking about the integrity of the gospel. That's why when people these days, you know, even in many churches, many Christians with the whole issue of gay marriage and things like that, in the acceptance of that, on that you're getting down to the integrity of the message of the gospel. Because you're then saying... If you receive that and accept it, then you're saying, well, this sin is not really sin. And you don't really have to deal with that. It's the glossing over it. The understanding that no sin is worse than another in the sense that it all has to... Jesus paid for it all on the cross. And so, that even say suddenly... Well, that's not a sin. Well, which other one do you want to pick and exempt? And you're get, then, then getting away from the truth of the gospel. And there's a necessity to keep the focus. Yeah, when you get in the conversation, somebody asks you, well, is homosexuality a sin? Yeah, it's one of them. There's a whole bunch of them. But the issue is, the issue is then getting back to the gospel, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's not just about the homosexual, it's about everybody. We're all, we all have sinned. And we should accept none of them. As normative, we just don't justify sin of any kind. But see, that's the important, that's the important issue there. So we have to resolve the issues with God first. Those issues of our lives, those things that come up, those questions, we resolve them with the Lord first. And then what other people come up with, that's on them. On them. But we stand in the principles of of the gospel. And now we see in verses 6 through 10, Pilate really... uh, avoids making a decision about Jesus. And that's so often what people do. It says here, Now at the feast, he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. And there was one named Barabbas, who was chained with his fellow rebels, who had committed murder in the rebellion. Now here's somebody who was actually guilty of what Jesus was being accused of. Insurrection. 
he was both a, he was a thief, first of all, got involved in the insurrection that was taking place there, and in some situation we don't have the details of, he was guilty of murder, probably killing some official or or a Roman soldier or something like that. So he was guilty of that. Clear. Clearly guilty. But Pilate had established this practice of during the feast, during the Passover celebration, you know, to kind of placate the Jewish people a bit, he would release them to them whoever they wanted. He would just ask for a popular vote. I mean, what kind of legal system is this? And there was this guy here named Barabbas, whose name means, Bar means son, Abba means father, son of the father. Interesting. The son of the father, it's the choice between two sons of the father the Son of God, the Son of the Heavenly Father, or this man, Son of the Father. The guiltless here taking place of the guilty again. As Jesus has taken the place of each of us, as 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We might become the righteousness of God in him. In verse 8 we read, Then the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. Now, crowds tend to be fickle and, to an extent, programmable. The crowd welcomed Jesus just a few days before, but now the crowd is being used against him. The crowd approaches Pilate in order to gain the decision that they want. Interesting, when things can't be accomplished legally, use crowds. Does that sound familiar? Use crowds. And then you end up getting, really, when you have a crowd that's localized, it's generally overall a small group of people, but they affect the things greater because it looks like they're doing more. And so you have policies changing because a group of people in one location or another pulled down a statue. Does this make any sense? But we have the same thing taking place there as well. And that's the reason why many politicians support the cries of the crowds is because they support their goals. So we see that since our country is getting away from its historical fa base, it's being controlled to an extent by mob rule. It's being influenced by mob rule. Verses 9 and 10 we read, But Pilate answered, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had handed him over because of envy. You know, what was going on around here wasn't, wasn't a surprise to Pilate. For one thing, you know, he had people all over the countryside. He had his spies out and all of that. He knew what was going on with Jesus. You know, Jesus had been preaching for three years that he was getting reports back on what was taking place. And with the politics, he had been in uh, Jerusalem several years by this time. He knew what the politics were in, that were involved with the high priest and all of that. 
So none of this was a surprise to them, and they, he knew where they were coming from, that the high priest, that the Jewish leaders were motivated by envy in having Jesus arrested. The chief priests envied the crowds that were showing up with, as Jesus preached and following him. Envy, by definition, is discontent and covetousness with regard to another's advantages, success, or possessions. In their minds, it had to be all about them. Hey, we're the religious leaders. Now, they had their crowd but they still weren't satisfied. In 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, it says, For you are still carnal, for where there is envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? James Four, two through three reads, You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and you warn and you war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Beware of where envy will lead you. The way we have to look at things is, in order not to fall into envy and strife, is to look at things the way, what, well, what's Lord, the Lord doing in my life? What's he bringing into my life? Dealing, as it said there from the James passage, you don't have because you don't ask. You're trying to do these things. You're trying to manipulate situations, but you're not asking the Lord, not leaving it. To, you know, I think sometimes we don't go to the Lord with matters because you know his decision's final. <laughs> you know, sometimes we try to manipulate situations. We try to manipulate or control people. Obviously, what was taking place I, you know, you wonder what these Jewish leaders really thought of God or if they thought about him at all. Obviously, the Sadducees, they didn't even believe in the supernatural, so who knows if they even believed in God. Pharisees, they were the legalists. They had the formula down. They didn't have to consult God. They, they were right about everything. And we need to be careful of falling into the same sort of situation, not seeking the Lord, not going to, God, what does your word say? What do you say on the matter? And always with, in mind, in heart, the two greatest commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. If, just think, if they were to look at those things, they got caught up in the profit. They had gotten caught up in the position, the power. And now in verses 11 through 15, we see that Pilate ends up making the wrong decision based upon social and political pressure. Verses 11 and 12. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd so that they rather, so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. And Pilate answered and said to them again, What then would you have me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? The question. The question again. What would you have me to do with Jesus? Always the question that every man, woman, and child has to face. What are you going to do with Jesus? Pilate had that choice here. He 
had the authority. He could make the decision. In fact, again, in John's account, he declared over and over again, I find no fault in this man. But because of political expediency, he had to be thinking, well, if I don't do what the Jews want this time, oh man, I'm going to get a bad report in Rome again. And ultimately, we see where trying to satisfy Rome got him. Committing suicide in Gaul. Perspective. A matter of perspective. So Pilate uh, tries to avoid making the decision about Jesus. But now he had come back to him. He wouldn't have put it up for a vote. Surprised to hear them call for Barabbas rather than Jesus. In fact, at this point, his wife even comes to him according to Matthew 27, 19 and says, I suffered in a dream last night for this guy. I have nothing to do with this righteous man. Just... Hands off, get away, get it. Oh. But you can't put off the decision forever. No one can. What are you going to do with Jesus? Now, it's easy for us to say as believers, I'm not in that position. I'm off. I've already accepted Jesus. But what about the way we live our lives as Christians? Sometimes we can put ourselves in the position of living as practical atheists. By that I mean we make our decisions at times as if God didn't exist. Yeah, we'll say, I accepted Jesus, I get, but how am I living on a daily basis? Am I seeking the Lord for His will for my life? Am I seeking to walk in the Spirit today and walk in obedience to Him to live the way He desires me to live? Or have I just formulated this plan myself that I'm trying to get accomplished? You know, it comes to us as well. We're called to walk uh, in obedience as well. Now, In verses 13 and 14, it says, So they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said to them, Why? What has he done? But they cried out all the more, Crucify him. And that crucify him is a command in Greek there. It's saying, Pilate, crucify him. Now Pilate, was looking for an excuse not to make a decision, but his past was catching up with him as well, not, being, not wanting to have another complaint. He asked the crowd for a reason. But note, they didn't give him a reason. They just started yelling louder. When your argument is bad... Say it louder. It has greater effect. That's the philosophy that they followed. Just scream. And again, isn't that what's taking place on our streets? No real solid argument. Let's have a discussion here, folks. No. A lady who said in the crowd, well, a mother who said all lives matter, was shot and killed. The mindset. Do you see this here as well? There are many 
who can't give a sound reason for not trusting in Jesus. But in reality, it's simply because they love their sin too much. But that doesn't make a good argument. So Pilate, notice, verse 15, wanting to gratify the crowd, wanting to satisfy the crowd. Always a mistake to satisfy the crowd. Whether your crowd is your friends, associates, whether your crowd is people at work, whatever your crowd might be, it's always a mistake to make a decision just to satisfy a crowd. It's always going to lead you the wrong way. Wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them. Again, somebody who was already convicted of murder and sedition. And delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. So he did what he thought was necessary in order to deal with the complaint of the crowd. But is a crowd ever satisfied? Remember the first time, again, we don't get the details from Mark, but he sent him and had him scourged. You know, the scourge, a cat of nine tails with nine straps connected to a handle, leather straps. In each strap, there's pieces of bone, glass, sometimes metal pellets, so that when it went across somebody's back, it tore the flesh. 39 lashes. Now, what they would do was every time, usually what they were doing in, doing, in lashing someone is trying to elicit a confession. And so that as you would confess, they would lighten up. On the whipping. Jesus had nothing to confess. Kept getting harder. But they were limited to 39 lashes. Many people died just simply from that. It's no wonder that he couldn't carry his cross. He brings, after the scourging, brings him back before the crowd and says, Behold the man. But still, still they cry out, Crucify him. Weren't satisfied. So when he saw that he was getting nowhere, he delivered Jesus to be crucified. The righteous was sentenced to die for the unrighteous. 1 Peter 3.18 tells us, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. It was for that purpose that he went to the cross. That was the issue that was settled. In fact, in Hebrews 11, or excuse me, 12, this always gives us perspective on that. As it says in Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
why he did it, for the joy set before him. When I think of what Jesus has accomplished on our behalf, on my behalf, it just totally blows me away. Think of the fact that on the one hand, as we read earlier, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That we are the ones who in reality are the criminals. We are the ones who have broken the law of God. We've sinned. But he comes to earth on our behalf takes our sin upon himself for the joy that was set before him. And what is that joy? You and me in his presence for eternity. That's the joy that's set before him for which he endured all of this. And if he was willing to do that for us, for me. That's why the writer of Hebrews saying, you know, see, we have such a great a cloud of witnesses. And looking unto Jesus, I can, it just makes sense. And of course, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, or because of God's mercy that he's shown you, as you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you may, be, that you may prove or live out, that it might be manifested in your life, what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's the reason. That's the joy set before him. That's where we are. But again, the choice is, the decision is, what am I going to do with Jesus? As a believer, what am I going to do with him? Am I going to seek to keep him in my nice religious compartment? Or am I going to do, like the writer of Hebrews says, fixing my eyes on Jesus? Are my eyes fixed on Jesus? Or if it's this thing or that thing that relates to me? Do I look good here? What is this situation? Or are my eyes on Jesus? Am I accepted by other people or is my, are my eyes on Jesus? That's the question. It's a decision that we all really have to make that can't be avoided. Because not only will it affect you and me, but it will affect those around us. What are we going to do with Jesus? And he's called us here. He has us here for a purpose. He has us here to work in our lives, to use us, to bring as many people into the kingdom as as possible before he returns. And in the times that we're living in, again, that are so much like the first century... We see what the choices are. We see what the choices are. Do we go with the crowd or we stand? Do we stand and say, Lord, your will be done, not mine. Not mine. And this is part of the reason, as I was praying, after we finish uh, Mark, we're going to go to the book of Acts. And as I prayed about it, I felt like, you know, this is the situation we're living in. It's getting so much, back, we're getting so much like the first century again, where Christianity is just this little, real Christianity is just this, you know, group of people out there. You know, but how do we make a difference? And I love the description from the Thessalonians 
who are declaring, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here too. I like that. Wouldn't you like to be known as... Actually, they had a misunderstanding there. The world was already upside down. The, it's the believers that were setting it right side up again, but that's what they declared. But for us in the Lord to be salt and light to the extent that the world would declare, hey, these people that have turned the world upside down have come here too. They've come to Cape Coral. What are we going to do? That's what I long to see take place in my life. And with all of us as well. Just to be that kind of salt and light. But let's pray. Father, again, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, may it sink in deep to our hearts. And Lord, you make the change in our hearts as you see fit, Lord. You know where I'm off. And Lord, I just know you continue to work. Father, may each of us lay aside every weight and sin that holds us back from following you, keeping our eyes on you, and living for you, Lord. We thank you for that, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.